Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for you. Lord, one day we will fly away. One day we'll be caught up to meet you in the air, and what a glorious day that will be. Until then, Lord, we know that you want us to occupy till you come. You want us, Lord, to, to live for you. You want us to glorify you. And, Lord, you want to bless us as well. Father, help us to hear from you tonight so that we might walk a little straighter <laughs> when we leave, that we would walk closer to you, Lord, that, that we would have a, a, a renewed love and passion for you because of who you are and what you've done. Lord, please bless this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of tonight's teaching is Greasing the Wheels of Obedience. Weird title, I know. But last week we ended with God reminding us that we're to be like obedient children. Uh, you know, not like how we were in our BC days before we came to Christ. Uh, but since we've been adopted into God's family, and since God is holy, that we should be holy in all of our conduct. And now God continues to speak to us through 1 Peter, and really along the same lines, but with a little bit different emphasis, really speaking on the why we should be holy. And the reason why, just to sum it up, is because of what it cost God to make us holy. See, it's one thing to obey God, to, to repent, uh, you know, to turn from our sins and do what is right simply because it's a right thing to do. Now, that really, that reason, <laughs> it, it really should be all that it takes for us to be willing to obey God, right? Well, God says it's right, and that's what I should do, so I'll, I'll do what's right, right? It should be. You guys are, no, no, that's not what it takes for me, you know. <laughs> but that should be all that it should take. But it's another thing, rather than to do just what we should do because it's the right thing to do, it's another thing to live our lives obeying God because we love Him. And because we're grateful to Him. And we're grateful to Him for His love. Scripture tells us the only reason we love Him is because He first loved us and gave Himself for us. We should be grateful for His love in what it caused Him to do for us in sending His Son from heaven to, to earth to be a man to be mocked and beaten, spit on, and, and then to be crucified for our sins. To die in our place. I mean, would we keep that in mind? If, we, if that was really on the forefront of our thinking, you know, when we do, I, I know for me, in my life, when I do that, obedience doesn't seem like a sacrifice. It's more of an opportunity to say, I love you in a meaningful way to the Lord. It's a way, you know, for me to say, you know, say thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for me. I, I, I got to think, it, and, and you might say that an attitude of gratitude is the best grease to lubricate the wheels of obedience. Think about that. See, it's just the opposite of dry legalism. Well, I can't do that, and I can't do that, and, and, and I really have to do that over there. It's a, that's a whole different deal. Man, those, those wheels get pretty dry and, and hard to move sometimes. But when it's an attitude of gratitude, when we consider what he's done for us, it's like, hey, I get to say I love you to God in this, in this thing right here and in, in obeying him over there. You know, here's another opportunity to show my gratitude. And so with that in mind, let's look at verse 17. He says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Now you might be thinking, well, that doesn't sound like what you just described. <laughs> well, no. But it is true, though, like we saw Sunday, uh, we are to be God-fearers and not people-fearers, right? We should be doing what's right because we, we have that 
that holy reverential fear of God. And this is part of this command here, 17, is, is part of the do what's right because it's what God says is right. He's basically telling us, if you've called on God to save you, if you pray to God to help you, then you ought to live out your life in fear or reverential respect for Him because He is God. But look at the next two verses, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. See, do what is right because God says it's right for sure. But knowing, and like we talked about before, you know, remembering, keeping in mind, not that we could, could ever fail to recall the facts uh, about Jesus dying for us and how God redeemed us, but we need to keep these things, the knowledge of this in the forefront of our thinking, that we weren't redeemed, which means to be bought back out of our slavery to sin and its consequences. We weren't redeemed with common things or corruptible things like gold and silver. Remember, we've talked about the last few weeks about the need to keep a right perspective, an eternal perspective, a heavenly perspective, and, and not a worldly perspective. In the world, they put a high value on gold and silver, right? In fact, what do they call those? Precious metals, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> are they really precious? I mean, think about gold, okay? Gold. God uses gold to pave the streets in heaven. That's God's asphalt, gold. Think about that. You know, like we've seen before, all of this world is going to grow old. It will corrupt. It will deteriorate. It will be burned up with a great noise and a fervent heat, but not the things of God. We, we've been seeing that over and over again the last few weeks, both on Wednesdays and on Sundays. Consider what this says. C consider what this shows us of God's love how much God loves us. God didn't send down a bunch of common asphalt <laughs> to earth to redeem us. Like, you know, hey, here, take this. I, I got lots of this up here. Uh, you know, I can always make more. It's no biggie. Go ahead, take this gold. He didn't do that. He, he, really, it wouldn't have atoned for our sins anyway. See, it had to be a man, and not just a man, but a perfect man, a sinless man, someone to, he had to be man to represent all of mankind, but he had to be sinless. He, he had to have no sin so that he did not deserve to die himself. That way he could die for our sins. He could pay the price for us because he didn't deserve to die for himself. God purchased us from our slavery to sin, from our sinful lifestyles that we were stuck in, and we were, my wife and I were talking about our testimonies um, on the way to church tonight. But you think about where you were at when you share your testimony about how God saved you, where you were at. He, God set you free from, from junk, didn't he? He set you free, but it was by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's how he set us free. He, he, he sent his son, his one and only son, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Yeah. The, the precious blood of Christ. And if you think about precious, which means you know, uh, a lot of value or, or expensive and that kind of stuff. And when you really consider the blood of Jesus Christ, it is precious. You know, one factor in determining value of anything is how rare something is, right? You think about old coins. Uh, you know, the face value, you might have a silver dollar. Some silver dollars are worth maybe 2 or $3. There are some silver dollars that are real rare, and if you've got them in mint condition, well, it might be several hundred thousand dollars, whatever. And, and because it's rare, it's very expensive. Well, there's only one Christ. There's only one Jesus. That's rare, folks. In 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, only one. And you talk about uh, you know, the value of a coin, 
uh, if it's in really great condition, uh, that it's worth more rather than one was in circulation for a long time and all. Jesus, the perfect man. Jesus never sinned. Very rare, very, very pristine, very perfect. And he poured out his blood for us as he hung on the cross to pay for our sins. Revelation 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Which brings up another factor in determining how precious or valuable something is. And that is need. And you think about it. The more people need something, the more value uh, it has, right? And the more precious it is. Uh, I, got, I got thinking about this today, but I went on walmart.com and... On Walmart.com, for 25 bucks, you can buy a 24-roll pack of the Super Mega Rolls of Angel Soft Toilet Paper. Okay? 24-pack there. <laughs> I'm going somewhere with this. But for the same $25, you can get a Steady Doggy Wind Spinner, Dahlia 61 in copper and bronze. Okay? And right now, it's like, well, that, that, that wind spinner is pretty cool, man. But... Three years ago, during the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, right? We saw how valuable toilet paper got, right? As many needed it, but you couldn't find it. I mean, there were people lined up at the grocery store because, oh, you're getting toilet paper in today? Cool. And, they, they were, man, they, were, they would wait for it. And the wind spinner? Eh, nobody was lining up for that. You know, but the toilet paper? Oh, yeah. Saw a lot of people, kind of like Gollum from the Lord of the Rings, you know, hugging a roll of TP. My precious! <laughs> but seriously, though, mankind, all of mankind, was eternally lost because of our sin, because all of mankind sinned, and therefore all of mankind needed to be redeemed. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's only through the blood of Christ that anyone can be forgiven, that anyone could be cleansed from their sin and brought into fellowship with God Almighty. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, only Jesus. Only Jesus could and only Jesus did shed his blood to pay for our sins. And we just read in Revelation 1, 5 that he washes in his own blood. Ephesians 1 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. But the blood of Jesus Christ doesn't just meet our need of that initial cleansing to remove all of our past sins so that we can come into fellowship with God. Understand, folks, the blood of Jesus Christ continues to meet the need of cleansing us from the sins that we commit daily. Anybody here that doesn't sin daily, that, that you know, you've gone for three or four days without sinning at all? Okay, that includes your thought life, too, all right? <laughs> yeah, I don't see any hands. Okay, I, I, okay we're, we're all okay then. Yeah, nobody's lying. <laughs> 1 John 1, 7 tells us, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The word cleanses is in the continual present tense. It means that he has cleansed, is cleansing, and will continue to cleanse us from all sin. How awesome is that? How precious is that? Because his blood just didn't take away our sin the first shot, and then now you're on your own. Now you're going to have to, to uh, you know, sell uh, Girl Scout cookies, you know, to pay for your sins. Or you're going to have to, you know, climb the Himalayas or something silly like that. You're going to have to work to pay for the sins that you commit after you get saved. No, the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us from our sin. Folks, the blood of Christ is extremely precious. It's rarer than anything in the universe. And it meets a need for every man, woman, and child. Nothing 
is more precious. Now think about that. Lock that in your head. There is nothing more precious than the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the price that God paid to redeem us. How awesome is that, huh? His, his only begotten son. Not with the asphalt of heaven, but with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Going back to the uh, Passover lamb there in Exodus, but also every other lamb that was sacrificed under the Old Testament system. It had to be pure. It had to be spotless. It had to be without blemish. Couldn't have any broken legs or anything like that. That and Jesus fit the requirements in every way. That's why John the Baptist in John 129, seeing Jesus come, points to him and, and says the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God without spot and without blemish. Knowing this, considering this, keeping this in the forefront of our thinking should cause us to want to obey Him as obedient children, right? Should help us. <laughs> we may wrestle with our flesh from time to time, not wanting to roll in God's direction, but this should cause an attitude of gratitude for what God has done and is doing and is going to do in our lives to, to, and that should help to make it easier to roll His way, huh? Now, Peter points out something that so many people miss, and especially some of the cults. That is the death of Jesus Christ, the death on the cross of our Savior for our sins, was no accident. It wasn't a spur-of-the-moment thing. You know, there's different cults, like, remember the Moonies? You know, some young moon uh, back in the 70s and 80s were teaching people that Jesus blew it. He wasn't supposed to die. And now he's here to do what Jesus failed to do. Guess where he's at right now? <laughs> yeah, I smell smoke. But, uh, look what Peter says in, in verses 20 and 21. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you through him Believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now, I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail on this because we've covered it a couple of times lately. But before God ever created mankind, in fact, before he ever created any of creation, for that matter, he knew that if he created this creature called man, <laughs> mankind, he knew that we would fall. He knew that he would have to die for us. And that's why Revelation 13, 8 says that Jesus uh, was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. See, he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, before he, God ever built the world. It was already determined in heaven that the Trinity, <laughs> the triune God had decided, we're going to create man. Son, you're going down there. And you're going to become a man and die for him. <laughs> that, that was before the world was created, but he was manifested, it says, which means to be revealed, to be made known for all of us who would believe in him and believe in God through him. The next statement might cause your ears to perk up a little bit, might tie your socks in a knot, whatever, but just hold on kind of thing. Did you know that there is a type of purifying or cleansing of ourselves that we're expected to do? You know that? Huh? What? Huh? A lot of socks starting to knot up right now. I know. It sounds blasphemous. <laughs> but look at verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. We purify our souls, he says, when we obey the truth. Now, what's the truth? Well, we just read John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But what did Jesus say that we were to do? You can sum up a lot of different passages where Jesus is quoted, and that is to believe in him and believe in the Father. John 6, 40 is one of them. Jesus said, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him 
may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The moment we put our faith in Jesus, we're purified. We're cleansed from our sins. Now, I understand. We couldn't do that on our own. You know, we, we just went through it a couple of weeks ago how no one would come to Jesus unless the Father drew him. The Holy Spirit has to work in us and draw us, showing us, convicting us of our sin and of righteousness and of judgment. See, convicting us of our sin, convicting us that we are not righteous, that we need righteousness, and that if we don't receive the righteousness of Christ, there's going to be a judgment that's appointed unto men, wants to die, and after that, the judgment. If he didn't do that, we wouldn't come to Jesus. So he, he initiates it he, and all that, but still, we have to do our part in receiving him, in believing in him. But there's also another way in which this is true as far as we cleansing ourselves, and that is when we physically repent from sin. In 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21, the Apostle Paul is writing to his, his young protege, uh, a, a pastor who traveled with him for a long time, uh, a guy by the name of Timothy. And this, is, this is in Paul's very last letter. He says, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. When we repent from that which is dishonorable, those dishonorable things, then we become vessels of honor and we're sanctified or set apart. And he says, useful for the master. If we won't repent, well, then we're not usable. <laughs> and it's a decision that every believer needs to make. But as Peter says, we have to obey through the Spirit. See, don't miss that. We have to be led and empowered by the Spirit to obey. We can't cleanse ourselves or purify ourselves by the works of the flesh or with our own power. We need the Holy Spirit, like we saw when we were in Philippians chapter 2, right? For it is God who works in us that causes us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. <laughs> if He wasn't working in us, we wouldn't want to do what pleases Him, and we wouldn't be able to do what pleases Him. But again, we have to choose to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, to, to, to lead us to do what is right, and we're to do that, he says, in sincere love of the brethren. And folks, sometimes we need to obey the Lord to turn from sin in sincere love of the brethren. In other words, because we love each other, we want to repent so we could be used by the Lord to minister to one another. That's one of the things. But, and that's the way it's worded in the New King James and in another of other translations. But there's another way that this can be understood. And I think it may be the main meaning of this passage, the NIV words it this way. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. See, now that we've obeyed the truth by putting our faith in Jesus, so that, that we can have, by being born again <laughs> and Him putting His Spirit inside of us, now we can sincerely love each other. Because before we were born again, <laughs> we couldn't. A lot of people, a lot of people that have never known Christ have uttered the words, I love you. But oh boy, the meaning, <laughs> what they mean by that. There's a lot of times, I love you means I lust after you. <laughs> or I love you means, well, you know what? I could get a lot of benefit from you. <laughs> but, but, I love you, real love, that agape love, the self-sacrificing love that Christ has for us. That only comes by, by being born again. That only comes by the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And he gives us its commandment. If we're born again, if now we have the ability to love one another. He says, love one another with, you know, fervently with a pure heart. And you know what? I, I'm so blessed as a pastor that I see a lot of that going on in this fellowship. People, you know, when somebody's hurting or when somebody is sick, 
uh, whatever, it, man, I, I see you folks really minister to those people. And, and that just blesses me. You know, there's always room for improvement, but a lot of it does go on in this fellowship. I hear from a lot of people that have been ministered to by folks in this fellowship that we never did some kind of official, okay, you know, uh, we're, you know, we're going to do this as a church. And oftentimes when, by the time I hear about something, you know, well, you, you know, so-and-so is really going through it. They really need, you know, this and this. By the time I already hear about it, I start asking, hey, do we need it? No, it's already taken care of. You know, this person at the church did this, and this person, they rallied this, and they got that, and yeah, it's all done. Cool, all right, <laughs> awesome, and, and that's a blessing. But coming back to how we've been redeemed and born again, look at 23 and 25, through 25. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. So think about that. Anyone who has been born again, saved from hell, going to heaven, we're going because we put our faith in Jesus. And, and the way that everyone has come to put their faith in Jesus is by hearing or reading the imperishable, eternal, enduring word of God. Yeah, it may have been paraphrased to you, you may have read it in a track, you may have heard it on the radio or, or saw it on TV, you know, and uh, Billy Graham doing some kind of thing, you know, there on TV. I remember when uh, we were young Christians and, and you know, there was uh, the UHF channels, remember those? <laughs> Back in the day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, those are always kind of looked on uh, as fringe channels. And I remember my wife coming in one time, Billy Graham was on TV, and he was on several of the major networks. And my wife says, honey, you got to come in here. Billy Graham is preaching on TV. It's not one of the weirdo stations. It's one of the big stations. <laughs> and a lot of people were saved by, by hearing the word of God through watching Billy Graham and people like him on TV and that. But it was the word of God. It was the word of God that, that came to you and me and everyone else. Again, it might have been paraphrased or whatever, but it was still, still the word of God that did that. Like Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And, and that's another reason why we're real big on teaching and preaching the word of God here, the Bible. And that's how people come to salvation is through the word of God and God always causes his word to do a work in those who hear it. Isaiah 55, 11. God says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not be turned to be void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. I've seen that over and over again. His word not only works through the power of the Holy Spirit, convicting and drawing us to God through the word of God, but the Word of God continues to be used by the Holy Spirit to work in us right now. I'm guessing that there, there's some of you right now that God's been working on you. As I have been teaching and that and, you know, quoting some scriptures, it's like, oh, oh okay, God, yeah, that's for me. You know, he's working through that, you know, through that Word, you know. Um, in in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul wrote to the Thessalonican church. He says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. And here it is, which also effectively works in you who believe. See, it doesn't just work in us to get us to believe, but once we believe, God continues to use his word to work in us. Now, Peter has quoted Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8, and, and we read that a few weeks ago on Sunday, uh, and uh, we talked about it again a couple of weeks ago. But the enduring word of God that was preached to Peter's readers and, and 
the word of God that caused them to believe in Jesus, folks, it's the same word of God that was preached to you and I. It's the same word of God that we're reading from right now. It's how we heard the gospel. <laughs> it's how we heard so we could believe. It's also the same word of God that we've just been studying right now tonight. And Lord willing, we'll do it again on Sunday. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it endures. Lord, that things of this world, yes, they're going to grow old. You're going to roll them up like a scroll. They're going to be burnt up. They're going to be dissolved. But your word will endure forever. Father, help us to trust you. Help us to trust your word. Help us to trust you enough to, to do what your word says. Lord, help us to love you and to be grateful enough to do those things that please you. Lord, help us to keep these things that we've seen in your word tonight in the forefront of our thinking, that they would help to, to move our wheels to roll in your direction every day, all day long. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.